So, uh, I am very thankful to the organizers. Very thankful to the organizers of this event for inviting me to give this talk on uh, Lenin, especially on the 147th anniversary of his birth on 22nd April. But talking about Lenin, even after 147 years after his birth, is turning out to be tricky. Whenever we say Lenin, whenever we start talking about Lenin, lot of instant questions are asked. And all these questions turn out to be almost, turn out to have almost the same uh, content. And this content is very nicely <coughs> captured by Slavoj Zizek uh, in one of his uh, recent articles on Lenin, where he says, and I quote Zizek, the first public reaction to the idea of reactualizing Lenin is, of course, an outburst of sarcastic laughter. Marx is okay. Even on Wall Street, there are people who love him today. Marx, the poet of commodities who provided perfect descriptions of capitalist dynamics. Marx of cultural studies who portrayed the alienation and reification of our daily lives. But Lenin? No, you can't be serious. The working class movement, revolutionary party and similar zombie concepts. Doesn't Lenin stand precisely for the failure to put Marxism into practice? for the big catastrophe which left its mark on the entire 20th century world politics. So this invariably is the reaction that we get in liberal circles, even sometimes in Marxist circles when we talk about Lenin. So <clears throat> uh, what he says, what Cizek says about Marx, that Marx is okay even on Wall Street, that I think is not completely correct. <clears throat> it has to be, uh, Marx is okay now for even liberals in a very qualified sense, in a very restricted sense, in the sense that capital is not okay. Uh, his writings, his explicitly revolutionary writings are not okay. What is okay is his uh, sort of early humanist writings. That is only okay. But then Lenin, even his earliest writings are not okay. The earliest writing, uh, one of the major earliest writings of Lenin is... Uh, what the friends of people are. Even that is not okay. So Lenin is, because of these reasons, Paul Leblanc has recently characterized Lenin as the universally dismissed revolutionary. Everyone dismisses him. And I think it is not a bad thing that everyone uh, dismisses him. So Lenin divides opinion more than any other thinker or political philosopher or revolutionary thinker in the 20th century. So much so that Christopher Reed has, was confident enough to remark that Tell me what you think of Lenin and I'll tell you who you are. So this is the level of <coughs> uh, division of opinion that Le Lenin is currently bringing into the, even into the Marxist circles. So there are uh, <coughs> three normal interpretations of Lenin that we see. All of them negative in one sense or the other. The first one I'll call the demonizing interpretation of Lenin, which sees Lenin as demon himself as the incarnation of Satan himself. So this is, uh, this interpretation is, you know, funny to read, but then there are lots of books being produced in this, with this mood. For example, David Remenek wrote in CBS News People of the Century that Lenin, and I quote, held a view of man as modeling clay and sought to create a new model of human nature and behavior through social engineering of the most, most radical kind. And to drive home his point, he quotes Richard Pipes, who says, and I quote, Bolshevism was the most audacious attempt in the history to subject the entire life of a country to a master plan. It sought to sweep aside as useless rubbish the wisdom that mankind had accumulated over millennia. Now this, if you have read Lenin, of course you have, if you have read Lenin, we know that this is rubbish. Because Lenin always talks about, with Marx, always talks about socialism being born from the womb of capitalism. Which means that we have to accumulate all the things that we have accumulated over the whole of two millennia. So this is, on the face of it, rubbish. But then these things are being written about Lenin. Uh, then there is a book by Helen Rapoport uh, named Conspirator, Lenin in Exile. I have not read the book, but then... I uh, will give you a commentary of the book by Paul Leblanc who says that Rapopo 
helps us see Lenin as a narrow authoritarian who fraught, fraught at the mouth when speaking, who gloried in political manipulations, surrounded himself with yes men and hashe men, helping to him to rise to power, and was a man whose mobile, malicious little eyes revealed something ruthless and predatory. This is the type of things that is being written in liberal circles, academic circles, that is, about Lenin. This, I would call, is the demonized interpretation of Lenin, which is just funny. I, I won't reply to any of these interpretations. Uh, but then there is a second interpretation of Lenin, which is sort of more cultured, more nuanced, and more dangerous. And this interpretation is captured by Neil Harding. He calls it the conventional academic wisdom on Lenin. He captures it very aptly, so I'll quote him uh, without having to paraphrase him. So Neil Harding says that, and I quote, there is a conventional wisdom which runs through almost all Western commentary, criticism and biography of Lenin. This line of interpretation has it that the nature of Lenin's genius is his ability to grasp the potentialities of the situation and turn it to his own advantage to maximize his power. As an instinctive politician, as a practitioner of revolution, he is incomparable. As a theorist of Marxism, however, he is inconsistent, unorthodox, and vacillating, as by, and by these tokens, comparatively unimportant. This we can see in a lot of academic works in Lenin. As Satya has just com uh, commented here, he is portrayed as a man who maximizes his power by vacillating between this position and that position and then uses classical Marxist te texts, his ability to use classical Marxist text to either support this position or that position as it needs be. This is a very uh, common interpretation that you see in academic circles and even I know some Marxists who, are, who go by this interpretation as Lenin as a practical genius but having no theoretical content whatsoever. There are many examples being given out to support this viewpoint. One of the examples that is given out is Lenin's idea on organization. Now, it is being said that in 1902, Lenin was supporting a vanguard party with strict secrecy, recruitment on the basis of class consciousness, underground organization, etc., etc., a group of professional revolutionaries. In 1905, this interpretation says he changed his stance. He wanted a popular party with maximum number of recruitment, expansion of party base, etc. 1908 to 1912, this interpretation goes, he again changed his stand and says that Vanguard party is a must, but only because of autocratic conditions in Russia. If it had democracy, then German socialist, uh, social democratic party in Germany is the best one. Then again in 1920, after the revolution, he is supposed to have changed his stand again during the Comintern and said that, Vanguard party is a must not only in Russia but all over the world and he is supposed to have put up 20 principles in the competent document uh, which, is, which supports this. Now this is being given as support as vacillating position of Lenin, as changing positions of Lenin as per this interpretation. Uh, we will come to the, the, the truth of these matters later but let me just brush through all these negative interpretations of Lenin before going to the real Lenin. So this is what we call the uh, semi-academic interpretation of Lenin. He sees him as an evil genius and nothing else, with no theoretical background whatsoever. But there is again the third interpretation, which is even more nuanced and even more dangerous. That interpretation is seemingly very sympathetic, but very dangerous and take on Lenin being promoted and, and this is being promoted by almost all uh, reformist organizations right now in India and abroad. Uh, this, see, uh, normally reformist organizations almost in India and abroad use Lenin very scaringly. I mean, I am from Kerala and I have had uh, uh, the uh, good fortune to watch social democratic politics very closely in Kerala and they use Lenin <coughs> only for a single thing and that thing is when they want to expel someone. When they want to expel someone from the party, suddenly Lenin becomes a very important figure. The 
sanctity of the party principle, the Leninist party organization principle, etc., etc., are all brought in when they want to expel someone. Other than that, they, they don't use Lenin at all. Now, this has a big problem because this is a, obviously a vulgar interpretation of Lenin. Uh, the, the party principle that Lenin had and the party principle that they think Lenin had are very different, as I will try to explain a little, late, little later. But this has a very uh, bad effect on others because then what they think is this is the real Lenin. So this vulgar interpretation of Lenin seems to them the real Lenin and that sort of magnifies their negative impressions of Lenin. This is happening in Kerala uh, and should be happening in many other places also. So the reformist interpretation or the social democratic interpretation of Lenin after 40 years, 50 years of social democratic parliamentary politics is now that Lenin is a very important historical figure and this historical figure has to be in quotes. That is, there is an effort going on to make Lenin into a relic. He is a great figure, he is a great man, he made the Russian Revolution, but his time has passed. He is not relevant to us at all right now. And the burden of carrying out this theoretical murder of Lenin to make him irrelevant has been taken up by none other than Prabhat Pataik, Professor JNU, who maintains that the Leninist conjecture is almost invalid now. In one of the uh, articles that he wrote in Hindu after the left were defe defeated in West Bengal, Prabhat Patnaik came out with a thesis that post World War II, Leninist conjecture has been superseded. What he says in that article is interesting. He says that post World War II, world capitalism and I quote, made three major concessions to ward off the communist threat. Decolonization, the institution of democracy based on universal adult suffrage and state intervention in demand management, that, that is Keynesian reforms. This meant that the world had started moving away from what one can call the Leninist conjuncture. The moment of dazzling success of communism was also ironically the start of its decline. We have to see, we have to carefully see what is actually meant by the word Leninist conjuncture. It, it means nothing else but that the state of affairs or the combination of circumstances or events, that is the word meaning of the word conjuncture, state of affairs or the combination of circumstances or events that made Leninism valid does not exist now. Patnaik is claiming, of course, in academic jargon, that Lenin's ideas are not relevant in this changed scenario. This claims, claim converts Lenin into a relic, someone to be revered and praised, but never to be applied. This is the idea. And this, if you talk to comrades, if you talk, talk to people uh, working in reformist social democratic circles, they express the same thing by saying that, of course, Lenin is our leader, he is a great man. But then see, the, the circumstances have changed. The, the socio, so, socio-economic circumstances have changed and we have to work up according to the new circumstances in which there is no role for Lenin at all. There is no role for his vanguard party, his principles, etc., etc. The same thing is told by Prabhat Patnaik in this article and the lecture after that in a very nuanced sense in, the, in, in, in saying, in stating it as that the Leninist conjuncture has been superseded. Now, these are the three important things, important interpretations that exist on Lenin right now. There is this demonist interpretation. There is this interpretation that Lenin is important in a practical sense, but then Lenin is, uh, has no theoretical thing to say or his theoretical side is not serious at all. There is this interpretation which has come up right now that uh, the time for Leninism has already passed. So uh, these, these three interpretations have something in common. They dismiss Lenin. They dismiss Lenin as unimportant. So who was this man? Uh, we would, uh, I would like to uh, explain or I would like to um, point to the fact that who is this man who has been rebuked, derided, loathed, brushed aside, universally dismissed, cast into the dustbins of history many, many times over the last hundred years, but still keeps coming back again and again into our lives. Who is this man whom the bourgeois cannot kill enough? He has been killed many times, but then they keep killing him again and again, which means that he is uh, coming back. So, in order to understand 
who this man is, I feel that there is no other way than read Lenin in origin. 40, 40 volumes of his uh, uh, collected works are available in English. And the best way to read, the best way to understand Lenin is to read Lenin in original. But then Lenin should be read in original, uh, but in context. Context is a very important thing for Lenin because one of the most important things Lenin repeated again and again, if you go through his reading, uh, writings, is the concrete analysis of the concrete situation. He always done, he always did the concrete analysis of a concrete situation. To, so to read Lenin, it is very important to place whatever he has written in context. So what I will try to do here <clears throat> as a part of this talk uh, of over 70 to 75 minutes is to try and understand three or four important interventions which Lenin made in the Russian uh, uh, socio-political situation and to place them in context. So, I think Lenin's role in the Russian Revolution cannot be understood by concentrating narrowly on his immediate role in 1917. It can only be understood by looking at his crucial interventions in the course of the preceding 20 years from something like 1897 to 1917. 20 years which gave the Bolsheviks and the Russian proletariat a revolutionary direction which prevented, for example, from going <coughs> them into the social democratic direction in which <coughs> the German uh, social democratic party went. These inter interventions, I will not treat them as historical relics, as things having only historical and educational significance. I shall attempt to demonstrate the contemporary le relevance of these interventions and the works that Lenin produced as part of them. This, of course, does not mean that we have to copy Lenin, but it means that imbibing the spirit of revolutionary Marxism which Lenin employed uh, is very important at this hour. So, my idea would be to here to put three or four interventions that Lenin made in Russia in its proper context and to, under, and to, and to uh, talk about the relevance of those interpretations right now in the Indian context. Before that, uh, I have to tell you something that Lenin said about Marx at the beginning of State and Revolution. He said, and I quote, what is now happening to Marx theory has, in the course of history, happened repeatedly to the theories of revolutionary thinkers and leaders of oppressed classes fighting for emancipation. During the lifetime of great revolutionaries, the oppressing classes constantly hounded them, received their theories with the most savage malice, the most furious hatred and the most unscrupulous campaigns of lies and slander. After their death, attempts are made to convert them into harmless icons, to canonize them, so to say, and to hallow their names to a certain extent for the consolidation of oppressed classes and the object of duping the latter. This is happening to Marx right now. If you see, there is a domestication of Marx going, now, going on right now. They, you sap all the revolutionary energy from Marx's writings and domesticate it. And that has been an, a, a veritable industry after the financial crisis. You see, there is this Mary, uh, I don't know, I don't remember the full name, Mary, Mary Gabriel or something. Her book on Marx, which is titled uh, Love and Capital which sort of domesticates Marx and then saps all revolutionary energy out of Marx and talks about Marx the man, Marx the lover, etc, etc. But then, surprisingly, there are no such things being done to Lenin. You don't see books often who claim Lenin the lover, Lenin the man, etc, etc. I wondered why that is. And I think it is because Lenin is not easy to domesticate. You see his first writing, his first major writing, that is friends of people and how they fight the social democrats. It is so direct and almost all writings of Lenin are so direct, so concrete that there is no, it is not easy to domesticate, domesticate Lenin. So I don't see anyone having succeeded in stripping him of the rebellious core and dragging him to the bourgeoisie's drawing room. It is proving impossible to fit Lenin into the bourgeois showcase. I think this is one of the most important strengths of Lenin. He is brutally direct 
and all of his books are he comes directly to the point and he hits the nail on the head there is no there is no roaming around and in this i think lenin is strikingly similar to jean luc godard's films godard's films are also notoriously difficult to domesticate because they are very very direct i mean the content is debatable but they are very direct and it's not easy to domesticate them as you do with bergman's films or other films so this we have to understand and what i propose is reading lenin in the original and i can assure you that reading lenin in the original is an experience one can sense a man in perpetual combat when you read lenin in original a man who is as lukacs once said the very embodiment of permanent readiness so that combativity that permanent readiness is apparent even in two page articles that lenin wrote so uh, i would like to say i would like to point out as time permits three or four interventions that lenin made and then how they are relevant what what the context of those uh, interpretations are and how they are at least relevant to our times but before that i have to talk about the premise of leninism what is the basic premise of leninism what is uh, its real essence i tend to uh, agree with uh, george lukacs who says that the basic premise of leninism is what he calls the actuality of revolution what is meant by actuality of revolution i shall quote george lukacs and i quote the actuality of revolution this is the core of lenin's thought and is decisive link to marx this means that the actuality of proletarian revolution is no longer on a world historical horizon horizon arcing above the left lib the self liberating working class but that revolution is already on its agenda so this george lukacs says the hungarian uh, marxist george lukacs says is the real essence of leninism the actuality of revolution but then uh recently prabhat patnaik has put forward the idea that the essence of lenin is uh, he he came up with the thesis as i told you that lenin's conjecture that lenin's idea the lenin's thesis has been superseded he based himself on the idea that the base of the premise of lenin the premise of lenin's idea is what he called the imminence of revolution the imminence of revolution George Lukacs was saying the actuality of revolution at first sight it may seem that both are the same uh, does actuality means the revolution is actual imminent means the revolution is here is that isn't it both the same but then it is not the word the word uh, imminence and the word actuality has slightly different but subtle very important different meanings uh, if you see merriam webster dictionary imminence means happening very soon or ready to take place hanging threateningly over one's head etc etc and actuality means the quality or state of being actual or real something that is actual or real which is different imminent imminence of revolution means revolution is about to take place what patnaik says is that Leninism is valid only when you have an imminently revolutionary situation that is revolution is already at the at the door but then lukacs never says that lukacs says of actuality of revolution which means that the revolution is not imminent it's not going to, it's not a revolutionary situation right now but then revolution proletarian revolution has ceased to be an illusion it has ceased to be a theoretical construct you can actually see proletarian revolution in the workers uh, plight of the workers in the objective conditions right now in the economy that is very different from imminence of revolution so uh, imminence of revolution means that revolution is about to take place and its actuality means that revolution has ceased to become an utopian illusion that the germs of revolution can be clearly discerned in the industries of the present society in fact lukacs also says that marx's and engels theory of proletarian revolution would have been impossible without actuality of revolution he says and i quote for historical materialism as the conceptual expression of the proletarian proletariat struggle for liberation could only be conceived and formulated 
theoretically when revolution was already on the historical agenda as a practical reality when in the misery of the proletariat in marx's words was to be seen not only the misery itself but also the revolutionary element which will bring down the old order so engel says in his utopian socialism that saint simon fourier owen etc etc could not come up with a dialectical theory of uh, revolution proletarian revolution because the objective conditions were not right they could not see it they could see it they could see socialist revolution only as an illusion they had to make up they had they had to make up conditions for proletarian revolution marx never did it marx predicted or marx theorized the birth of proletarian revolution from the womb of capitalism itself from the objective conditions developed out of capitalism itself and lenin says or luka says about lenin that this actuality of revolution is the main premise of leninism is the main aspect of uh, of of uh, leninism another two important very things that i have um, i think is very important when you talk about the premise of leninism is his use of dialectics and his use of class analysis the use of dialectics was given bequeathed to the russian movement by the great plekhanov of course plekhanov uh, went to the other side etc etc by 1904 but then lenin himself told many many times that plekhanov is the father of russian marxism so it is a very good thing advantageous thing that uh, plekhanov has done to russian marxism that in around 1988 1896 itself he bequeathed this great legacy of dialectics onto the russian movement and lenin took dialectics very seriously as we will see in all his interventions in russia dialectics was absolutely important for lenin another thing that was very important for lenin is class analysis he analyzed everything everything on class lines these two are really missing in indian movement right now and studying lenin will give you an idea give us an idea of how to creatively use dialectics and how to use class analysis to all concrete problems these two are very these three i think are very important premises of uh, lenin last thing on a personal note uh, one thing is very clear and very important lenin was properly in love with marxism he said he wrote a letter to inesa armand in 1917 in 1917 after the revolution which says and i quote i am still completely in love with marx and engels and i can't stand to hear them abused no really they are the genuine article so he had very high notion of marx and lenin uh, marx and engels and he did not keep it a secret but then that did not push him to dogmatism that did not push him to uh, say that whatever marx said 100 years ago is correct for all eternity uh, this is apparent from his polemics with polish socialist party on the nationalist question in uh, in this polemics he writes and i quote but while marx standpoint was quite correct for the 40s 50s and 60s or for the third quarter of the 19th century it has ceased to be correct by the 20th century he is directly contradicting marx here the attempt of psp polish party in 1896 to establish for all time the point of view marx had held in different epoch was an attempt to use the letter of marxism against the spirit of marxism so he gave great importance to marx and engels clearly but to the spirit of marxism not to the letter of marxism i can tell you four or five or six different instances in which he directly contradicts marx what marx said he says it is it was correct then but it is not correct now so there was no dogmatism in lenin with respect to marx or engels so these are the main premises these are the main aspects which i see are very important for uh, uh, lenin and then people say whenever pe- is speaking about lenin lenin is the premise of leninism that lenin maintained that the aim justifies the path lenin never said that i could never see lenin saying that in any of his writings but it is widely quoted over the internet if you see the internet it is widely quoted that lenin maintained that the aim justifies the path his idea is that the aim does not justify the path neither the, does the path justify the aim there is a dialectical relationship between the path and the aim and that dialectical relationship is established by 
nothing else than the actuality of revolution. The actuality of revolution, the fact that revolution, proletarian revolution is an actual possibility, is the touchstone by which all day-to-day -day activities of revolutionary politics has to be uh, seen. So, uh, Lukács says it very nicely when he says, the actuality of revolution therefore implies study of each individual daily problem in concrete association with the socio-historic whole as moments, as individual moments in the liberation of the proletariat. So, uh, for example, you have a wage struggle today. A Leninist principle, a Leninist organization, a Marxist Leninist does not see a wage struggle as a wage struggle. It sees it as an advance, as one step towards the revolution. So, it is seen as a, a step in the process and not as a step in itself. So, this can only be done if you have a clear understanding of the actuality of revolution or if you have a clear understanding of the historical hold as, as a totality cannot be done uh, if you don't have the totality in mind. So, I think the dialectical union of the question of the day and the fundamental problem of revolution shines through as the biggest achievement of Lenin's thought and politics. All of Lenin's political thought is a study in the dialectical union between the immediate political questions and the ultimate revolutionary struggle. We will see how this works out when we see uh, each of his interventions. But then I think that actuality of proletarian revolution is the premise of Leninist conjuncture and it is the actuality, it is, it is a keen idea of the actuality of proletarian revolution that gives Lenin the connection between day-to-day -day struggles and the final aim. It is a, this dialectical union that is his biggest achievement, I think, the politics of, of Lenin's politics. Okay, so the first intervention that I would like to uh, put before you is his studies on development of capitalism in Russia. That is the major, that is one of the major, that is the first major study that he took up. It is a 600 page study for which he is, uh, he wrote it, a major part of it in jail. And he is supposed to have referred in between 500 to 600 books to write this uh, development of capitalism in Russia, the book development of capitalism in Russia. Now, we have to put this book in context. What was happening, uh, it, it was published in 1897 when Lenin was just 27 years old. And that time, in 1861 itself, as you may know, uh, the serfs, the emancipation of serfs in Russia was in 1861. And after that, there was a big question going on in Russia, whether Russia has started on the capitalist path in agrarian, agrarian uh, uh, question or is it still in the path of non-capitalism? Now, Lukács again captures the central Russian question in the late 19th century, and I quote Lukács, the central question was, was the European course of development, the development of capitalism, the inescapable fate of Russia as well? Must Russia too pass through the capitalist hell before finding salvation in socialism? Or would she, because she was unique, because her still ex because of her still existing village communes bypass this stage and find a path from primitive direct to developed communism this was the question can russia bypass capitalism altogether this was a question being raised by russian populists what are called narodniks in the late 19th century and narodniks believed and they proved sort of that and they tried to prove sort of that capitalism is not possible in russia at all the major book of populist uh, book that tried to prove this is V.P. Vorotsov's The Fate of Capitalism in Russia, in which he proved, he tried to prove that capitalism is not possible in Russia at all. I quote from his book when he says, and I quote, the People's Party, that is the populist, would stand to gain a great deal if to its faith in the vitality of foundations of peasant life was added a conviction of the historical impossibility of the growth of capitalist production in Russia. So, if capitalism is impossible in Russian agrarian relations, then the question being raised was, which is the class which will lead Russia to revolution? It cannot be proletariat, because if agrarian uh, situation is not characterized by capitalism, then an independent proletariat cannot be born at all. 
So there is no question of workers' revolution. It has to be, the socialism has to be obtain, obtained directly from uh, natural economy, direct jump to socialism, and the class that takes it forward will be peasants. So that was the idea of Narodniks. And it is interesting to note that Plikhanov was a Narodnik to start with. Plikhanov wrote, early Plikhanov in 1895 wrote, before he came to Marxism, he wrote, and I quote, therefore, so long as the majority of our peasantry adhere to the land holding pattern that is now here, we cannot maintain that our homeland has set off on the course of that law, according to which capitalist production would be an essential stage in its path to progress. So you can bypass capitalist production uh, 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 completely. What was the facts that made Russian populists so, so, uh, you know, so sure that capitalism can, can be bypassed in Russia? It was what is called communes, village communes. It was specifically Russian uh, construct, these village communes. So the main point of departure for the Narodniks or the populists was that, was that the establishment of socialism in Russia would have to be based on these village or peasant communes, which was specifically Russian feature. The Russian peasant commune was a system based on communal land ownership. The land was owned not by persons or by families, but by the commune which periodically redistributes the land uh, for various uses according to the size of the family and the needs. The existence of communes meant that a powerful sense of social justice prevailed inside the peasant communities. Furthermore, these communes were very localized and extremely self-sufficient. They produced everything that was needed for their subsistence and never produced anything intended for the market. So, the persistence of these village communes, persistence of self-sufficient village communes, persistence of a natural economy in India, uh, sorry, in Russia, uh, made it sure for the populace that Russia had no need for capitalism and capitalism was not going to develop in Russia at all. Capitalism cannot penetrate these communes, that is what they said. Uh, but then, a man called Orlo wrote a book in late 1800s uh, which was which which was called communal property in moscow district and that was a watershed in populist politics completely because that proved that commune system was fastly getting eroded he concentrated on moscow but that proved beyond doubt the decay of communal property system and it was this book actually is one of the reasons why Plikhanov shifted to the Marxist position that Russia is on the path of, of uh, uh, capitalism. Now, how did Lenin combat this position? Mainly in his articles from 1896 to 1902 and his book, Development of Capitalism in Russia, how did he combat this populist position? Uh, Lenin thought that the fundamental error that the populist was making in the appraisal was capitalism was their failure to view it as an organic process of growth characterized by different features at different stages of its evolution. They characterized capitalism simply in terms of typical contradictions of advanced industrial capitalism. So what was missing from populist idea of the absence of capitalism was exactly dialectics. The method of Narodniks was flawed in that they were not viewing capitalism as a process but were looking for finished signs of capitalism. They were refusing to see pointers on the process of growth of capitalism and the decay of natural economy uh, in Russia. So the methods of Lenin and the method of Narodniks offer a very stark contrast and this contrast is I maintain because of Lenin's grasp of dialectics. The Narodniks start with neat cut and dried notions of what capitalism is. Based on their study of uh, Western capitalism, industrial capitalist countries, they think that capitalism has to be like this. It has to have hand land holding patterns like this, it has to have industrial proletariat like this, etc. etc. So they start with neat cut and dried notions of what capitalism is and what it will look like. They looked for these finished pointers and did not see them in Russian socio-economic situation. This they mistook for robustness and vitality of Russian village communes in resisting capitalism. Following this, they theorized the various reasons for the impossibility of capitalism in Russia. 
Lenin, in contrast, did not begin by looking for symptoms of fully developed capitalism in Russia. It cannot be. Fully developed capitalism is not in Russia. He documented the process of slow but steady decay of the commune system and its main reasons. He was investigating the direction of movement of history. In this, he was able to perceive the growth of capitalism and formation of a proletariat, a semi-proletariat in rural Russia. So the difference, as Lenin stressed, was not one of facts. In fact, the ironic uh, situation was that Lenin was using the same facts that Narodniks were using. They were using the same tables. They were using the same economic tables. But then Lenin uh, came to a radically different conclusion from Narodniks in the sense that Lenin could perceive the growth of capitalism, whereas Narodniks believed that as pointers of fully finished capitalism are not there in Russia, commune system is in, uh, impenetrable in Russia. But then uh, there is an academic interpretation also regarding this. It says that Marx had maintained at some point uh, towards the latter part of his life that Russia can go directly from uh, agrarian commune system to uh, communism, to socialism. And there is this Robert Survey's biography of Lenin. It is a travesty of Lenin, in fact. It vulgarizes Lenin like anything, but it is a very good read. It is a, because you can see a lot of these things there. And he quotes, uh, Robert Service quotes a letter that uh, an agrarian social terrorist in Russia by the name of Vera Sasulich, Sasulich wrote to Marx himself asking whether he believed that the scheme of social development he had sketched out for advanced capitalist states was ne necessarily applicable for agrarian Russia. And Robert Service says that Vera asked Marx, and I quote, might there not be a chance for a largely pre-capitalist country such as Russia to avoid capitalism altogether and adopt socialism? The reply she received from Marx was gratifying. Far from claiming that capital offered a template for all countries, he accepted that Russia's agrarian economy and peasant communal traditions might allow it to have socialist transformation without capitalist industrialization. Huh? This is in 1890s, the, uh, sorry, 1880s, the beginning of, towards the end of Marx's life, towards the end of, this, uh, this, this was a letter written by Marx to Vera, saying that peasant communes can be used to skip, if needed, uh, industrialization altogether. And service implies in his biography of Lenin that because of this letter, Lenin was completely falsifying Karl Marx. Karl Marx had said that you can bypass uh, in Russia, in special conditions of Russia, you can bypass capitalism. But <coughs> Lenin maintained that it cannot be bypassed. The issue is not like that. What service is missing is that Lenin never said that, Lenin never even asked the question whether uh, capitalism can be bypassed in Russia or not. That was not the question which Lenin asked. Lenin was trying to prove and Lenin was thinking, Lenin was proving that capitalism cannot be bypassed in Russia because capitalism is already in Russia. Not, see, uh, service says that Marx has been privatized here, but there is no such thing at all. Marx was talking about commune system when capitalism, when commune system was not in decay. Lenin is talking 20 years later when the decay of commune system has already started. So what Lenin is saying is that there is no question of bypassing capitalism right now in Russia because the first stage of capitalism is already in Russia. The decay of communes have already started. The uh, serfs have already been freed. See, all throughout the world, the decay of natural economy comes with the introduction of money into it. Even India, even in India, as Marx pointed out in his writings, it was the uh, tax collecting system of the British that broke the back of the natural economy. Because if you want cash, you have to go to commodity production. So in Russia also, as Lenin points out, what broke the communes essentially was the 1861 uh, emancipation of serfs. This emancipation of serfs was not a great act in such, but it was an act which made sure that the Tsar autocracy got money. 
so they needed money they needed tax so all the serfdom was abolished and they wanted it to be paid in money if they need money then you have to switch to community pro commodity production so <coughs> uh, how did lenin say that russia is already on the path of capitalism crucial to uh, crucial to lenin's whole position in the controversy was his minimal definition of capitalism as no more than a particular stage of commodity production at which not only products of human labor but human labor power itself becomes a commodity this is neil harding's words about lenin's definition of capitalism it's a very simple definition of capitalism you don't look for other things you look whether there is a movement towards making human labor power itself as a commodity if it is if that movement has started you can say that the growth towards capitalism has already commenced you may not see many other pointers as you have seen in other industrial capitalist countries but if this has commenced then the dkf commune will follow in fact the dkf commune had already started so uh, here you can see that the difference between narodniks and the difference between Nar lenin and narodniks it not as much in facts but in method it is the dialectical method that helps lenin perceive the mo the movement towards capitalism and capitalism not as a finished product okay so uh, what does this has for us what 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 do this this idea has for us of course we uh, learn the method but then the idea that is relevant to india right now is the approach that lenin followed of course the approach that all revolutionary marxists followed towards the growth of capitalism in russia as well as in other countries for example the decay of peasant communes along with the disintegration and differentiation of peasantry is a human tragedy but at the same time an inescapable historical trajectory which gives rise to the revolutionary proletariat see the 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 decay of commune system the decay of handicraft system and the liberation of peasants and liberation of handicraftsmen from that and their uh, total shift to the urban proletariat is a human tragedy there is no there is no uh, two two sides of that but then it is a progressive thing in that in the sense that it brings proletariat into being but the question is what should be the approach of revolutionary to it what should be the approach of conscious revolutionary to revolutionaries to this process should they welcome it find happiness in it and try to aggravate it or should they bemoan it as a tragedy try to pull it back and preserve the small peasant and the handicraftsman both you know have been tried in india and both have been tried by the left and both by left time in parliamentary left both have been tried by the left and both have been tried simultaneously so in in bengal you see the conscious effort to industrialize to displace the agrarian peasants and industrialize there the idea given is that see capitalism has to come for socialism to come so we are bringing in capitalism that is the idea but then in kerala if you see there is a by the same party by the same cpi cpim etc all the uh, parliamentary block there is an idea that runs that you have to conserve handicrafts you have to conserve small farmers you have to conserve uh, handloom weavers etc etc so cpm runs uh, uh, campaigns to conserve all these things both are wrong obviously both are wrong and lenin's ideas on this are very important the missing thing here is the concept of dialectical totality as lukas says and i quote lukas again and i quote the recognition of a fact or a tendency as actually existing by no means Im implies that it must be accepted as a reality constituting a norm for our actions it may be the sacred duty of every genuine marxist to face the facts squarely and without illusions but for every genuine marxist there is always a reality more real and therefore more important than isolated facts and tendencies namely the reality of the total process the totality of social development see the idea of revolutionary marxists or revolutionaries towards the decay and disintegration of small farmers peasants agrarian communes natural community uh, handlooms handicrafts etc can only be understood if you see the actuality of revolution if you see this as a process if you see it is in, in in its totality 
and you can see that Lenin's approach to this problem was classic. Lenin writes, and I quote, the bourgeoisie makes it its business to promote trusts, drive women and children into the factories, subject them to corruption and suffering, condemn them to ext extreme poverty. These are all the results that happens because of the decay of the communes. He continues, we do not demand such development. We do not support it. We fight it. But how do we fight it? We explain that trusts and employment of women in industry are progressive. We do not want a return to handicraft system, to pre-monopoly capitalism, domestic drudgery for women, forward through trusts, etc., and beyond them to socialism. So here you see the idea that I have uh, expressed before that everything is being done with actuality of revolution in mind, with the total process in mind. So Lukács sums up the idea. The recognition of the necessity of capitalist development in Russia and of the historical process implicit in, the, in this development by no means compels the proletariat to support it. That was Lenin's position. The proletariat must welcome it, for it alone establishes the basis for, of its own appearance as a decisive force, but it must welcome it as a condition and premise for its bitter struggle against the real protagonist of capitalism against the bourgeoisie. This is a remarkable thing that Lenin has done. Lenin's quote is an exemplary example of his dialectical approach to political problems. He says that, that the proletariat does not demand capitalism. Neither does it support it. They fight it. How? By welcoming it. Now, this is illogical as far as rationalists are concerned. How can you support a thing by welcoming it? That is illogical if you have a rationalist mindset. But they will say, how can one fight capitalism by welcoming it? But for a materialist dialectician, this is the only correct way because he sees this as a process and hence sees its future as well as its past, views it in its totality. Lenin has many times said that a concrete uh, situation can only be viewed as a process, of, process, as a process. You have to view its past as well as its future. So yes, it is a human tragedy. Yes, the, 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 uh, uh, all the things that happens because of the destroyed, uh, because they destroy natural economy is a human tragedy, but it is leading us to the creation of proletariat and the objective condition, the ripening of the objective condition for socialist revolution. So this is the dialectical process that happens in Lenin and this is the right dialectical process that Lenin follows and this is of uh, crucial importance for us now for India now. I don't have to say that in India, in almost all rural parts of India, the same thing is happening right now. The handicrafts are being destroyed, handlooms are being destroyed, natural, whole objective condition for natural economy is being destroyed, etc, etc. But then, the left's approach to that is not correct, as per Lenin itself. Now, in this, I will quote uh, what Lenin wrote in uh, the review of Kautsky's book, The Agrarian Question. Kautsky's two-volume book, The Agrarian Question, is very important. It was praised by Lenin as one of the most important contributions to Marxism after Marx's uh, third volume of Capital. It is another matter that Kautsky became a renegade later. But then at this, at this moment that we are talking about, early 1900s, Kautsky was very much a Marxian. So he reviewed this book, Lenin reviewed his, this book, and he wrote, and I quote Lenin, the radical transformation of agriculture by capitalism is a process that is only just beginning, but is, it is one that is advancing rapidly, bringing about the transformation of the peasant into a hired laborer and increasing the flight of population from the countryside. Attempts to check this process, this is very important, attempts to check this process would be reactionary and harmful. No matter how, how burdensome the process of this, uh, how burdensome uh, burdensome, the consequences of this process may be in present day society, the consequences of checking the process would be still worse and would place the working population in a still more helpless and hopeless position. Progressive action in present day society can only strive to lessen the harmful effects which capitalist advance exerts on the population to increase the consciousness of the people and their capacity for collective self-defense. This is the direct quote from Lenin from his review of Hotsky's book. And what are the progressive measures that he says are only possible? 
he agrees with Kautsky on this guarantee of freedom of movement on the abolition of all remnants of feudalism in agriculture on the prohibition of child labor under the age of 14 establishment of an eight hour working day strict sanitary police to exercise ex exercise supervision over workers dwellings etc etc that is you minimize the negative effect that this human tragedy is having on the proletariat you don't try to pull it out and you don't try to support also you don't try to aggravate also there is a very thin dialectical line which has to be followed here and Lenin as we can see follows exactly the same line which I am afraid the left is not following right now at least the parliamentary left is not so as you know L Lenin's uh, work on development of capitalism in Russia was written <coughs> some uh, 100 years ago more than 100 years ago uh, but we still have a lot of things to take from it one is the use of dialectics one is his use of totality, another one is his approach to this human tragedy, etc. etc. The second uh, important intervention that Lenin made after uh, his study on, see, in, in many of the uh, academic studies that I quoted before, it was said that Lenin's theoretical background was extremely flimsy. He was a genius politician which uh, was vacillating in theory. But if you read Lenin, in context and seriously, you see that up to 1914, up to the First World War, up to the advent of imperialism as a major force, all of Lenin's politics and all of Lenin's turns are basically and strongly based on this book, The Development of Capitalism in Russia. It is based on a very, very rock solid foundation of the study of socio-economic relations of agrarian capitalism in Russia that he bases everything from 1900 to round about 1913 when imperialism becomes the most important thing. So if you see through Lenin's writings, you can see that it is this book which is very crucial to Lenin up to 1914. Then up from 1914 onwards, imperialism takes up. Okay. <clears throat> the second thing <clears throat> that I want to say, uh, the second important intervention that Lenin made is on the question of organization and this Lenin's idea of vanguard party or Lenin's idea of organization is one of the most misinterpreted misrepresented and vulgarized notion of the whole of 20th century so it is very important to put it in context in which context did Lenin write what is to be done what is to be done in the principal text uh, of organization by Lenin and uh, with the other text which is one step forward and two steps back and other writings also. <clears throat> so the context in which Lenin <clears throat> was writing the need for a vanguard party in Russia is of brutal, brutal autocracy. There was a complete absence of a pan-Russian revolutionary organization, proletarian organization. What was present were scattered study circles and nothing more with no real clear connection with the struggling proletariat. So what Lenin wanted is such a pan-Russian organization and if you read what is to be done, see one of the biggest vulgarizations, one of the biggest critiques that is on Lenin's head, laid on Lenin's head is that he was very interested in uh, you know, manipulating the workers, making workers do what he or the party wanted them to do etc etc. But if you read Lenin's what is to be done. He does not complain about the workers. His complaint is not about the uh, lack of enthusiasm or lack of spontaneity, lack of struggle among the workers. He says workers are struggling. Workers have spontaneously started struggling, but we are not catching up. We means the revolutionary study struggles which were scattered all around Russia. His complaint actually was that we are not catching up with the workers. The intelligentsia is tailing the workers. That is the main thing that he says in what is to be done. It is uh, portrayed in bourgeois circles as the other way around. It is portrayed that Lenin said workers does not have any, any, uh, does not have any capacity to struggle on their own. So we have to import struggle from, up, uh, from the top, etc., etc. That was not the point here. The point here was that there was a huge strike wave in Russia around uh, in the late uh, 1800s, in the beginning 1900s. And the problem was Lenin was facing is that we are not able to cope up with that. We are not able to direct these struggles to a more, 
towards the totality. Now, what is the main idea? What is the main idea of, so this is the context in which he developed it. And the context is very important because five years after the publication of Cheto Dala, that is the, what is to be done, the pamphlet, what is to be done, Lenin stated that, and I quote Lenin, the basic mistake made by those who criticize what is to be done is to treat the pamphlet apart from its connection with the concrete historical situation of a definite and now long past period in the development of our party. So Lenin maintains here that it is a contextual document. So you have to see it in the contextual document. The context was one of huge autocracy without democratic revolution. Democratic revolution was not consummated in Russia. This was written in 1902. There was no democracy at all. It was autocracy and revolutionary uh, uh, groups were scattered all around and they were not able to cope up with the incessant strike waves that were happening in Russia. So Lenin writes, and I quote, the spontaneous element in a sense represents nothing more nor less than the consciousness in an embryonic form. He does not say that there is no spontaneity in workers. Yes, there is spontaneous struggle happening all over Russia. But what he maintains is that these spontaneous struggles that the workers are beginning to have are not, are, represents nothing more nor less than consciousness in an embryonic form. This nor less is missed by a lot of people. He says nothing more but nor less. Now the question is, what is this proletarian consciousness that he was talking about? Now there are two aspects, I mean one can say that there are two aspects of proletarian consciousness. One is the fact that proletariat is both the subject and the object of history. It is the object of history because capitalism has given birth to the proletariat. It is a subject of history because it is the proletariat that is going to change history by changing capitalism, going beyond capitalism. That is one thing. Second thing is that proletariat is the only class in history which strive to demolish its own class. See, the, the, the process of going from capitalism to communism or socialism is the destroying of proletariat itself. So what, what is the proletariat striving for? Proletariat is striving for its own different disenfranchisement, its own dissolution. So these two facts are not obvious. These are present in embryonic form in all workers' struggle, but there is a need to bring this to the fore. There is a, uh, uh, there is a need to channel this spontaneity that is always there in workers' struggles. Lenin says in what is to be done, and I quote, <clears throat> even the primitive revolts expressed <clears throat> the awakening of consciousness to a certain extent. The workers were losing their age-old faith <clears throat> in the permanence of the system which oppressed them and then began, I shall not say to understand, but to sense the necessity of collective resistance, <clears throat> definitely abandoning their slavish submission to authorities. But this was nevertheless more in the nature of outbursts of desperation than of struggle. The revolts were simply the resistance of the oppressed, whereas the systematic strikes represent class struggle in embryo, but only in embryo. Taken by themselves, these strikes were simply trade union struggles. They marked the awakening of antagonisms between workers and employers, but the workers were not and could not be conscious of the irreconcilable antagonisms of their interests to the whole of the modern political and social system. That is, theirs was not yet social democratic consciousness. This is what Lenin says in uh, what is to be done. Here, there is no question that spontaneous upsurges, spontaneous struggles comes from the part of the workers themselves. We cannot make a revolution, we cannot make spontaneity, we cannot make struggles also. What is to be done is to give channels to the spontaneous struggles coming out of the workers themselves. Spontaneous struggles catch class consciousness in an embryonic form, but only in embryonic form. This is true now also. For example, there was a big, very spontaneous struggle from the part of tea plantation workers in uh, Wayanad in Kerala. Wayanad and Iduki districts in Kerala, they are hilly districts in Kerala. Tea plantation workers are one of the most uh, uh, badly living workers in the whole of Kerala. There was a spontaneous struggle and almost 100% of tea plantation workers are women. 
so they were only women struggling against the whole of uh, uh, the the employers in tea plantation and it had a lot of support in kerala but then it ended up the struggle was going on and uh, left parties tried to intervene in the struggle but then the, these women workers refused to take their help etc etc but after two two weeks the demand was for shareholdings in tea plantations they started with living conditions etc etc and then the demand sort of petered out and then en ended up with uh, a demand for shares in in the company obviously it's not a proletarian demand by any means it's not a proletarian demand so if you leave the spontaneous upsurge of the workers this was very spontaneous it was extremely strong and it got hold of the kerala public like anything but if you leave it if you leave it to itself the bourgeois hegemony is so complete is so you know critical that it will in due course take the bourgeois way that is said by lenin itself in either another part of what is to be done i have not written it down but if you leave it completely to spontaneity it is going to choose the bourgeois path and that is not good at all you can see it in pf struggle in bangalore that was a very spontaneous struggle no one instigated that struggle and even the fascist government who takes so much pride in their intelligence police and army networks had to take back that pf amendment in 48 hours 2 lakh women textile workers went to struggle in in bangalore in the streets of bangalore so spontaneity is definitely there and spontaneity is a great uh, uh, great thing which we have to which we have to understand but then left to itself the bourgeois economy is so much so that it will take the bourgeois route that is what lenin says he says that we have said that there could not have been social democratic consciousness among the workers it would have to be brought to them from without the history of all countries shows that the working class exclusively by its own effort is able to develop only trade union consciousness that is the conviction that it is necessary to combine in unions fight the employers and strive to compel the government to pass necessary labor legislation the theory of socialism however grew out of philosophic historic and economic theories elaborated by educated representative of property classes the intellectuals by their social status even the founders of modern social uh, scientific socialism marx and engels themselves belong to the bourgeois intelligentsia so he is not talking about manipulating the workers he is not talking definitely not talking about manipulating the workers as per the party demand he is talking about channeling of spontaneity and only that channeling on spontaneity direction direct the spontaneity consolidate the workers immediate impressions generalize it and make them aware of the totality the systemic aspects of their problems that is the only way and this explains the dialectics between day to day struggle and the final aim and this also effects the unification of what is called the class in itself and class for itself what lenin maintains is by spontaneity you can reach up till class in itself and if you want to go beyond that then uh, channeling of spontaneity is really required that is the only uh, historic duty of vanguard that is the main historic duty of vanguard now this was written in 1902 the question is how is this relevant to us now there are lot of people left who maintains that what is to be done was correct in russian context in 1902 but it is not relevant now at all many comrades tell me in kerala for example in south india that the situation has changed that is the that is the you know the word used the situation can't you see that the situation has changed and we have to adapt to the new situation when i ask them okay the situation has changed this is 2017 it's not 1902 but in what way has the situation changed then they say can't you see that there is whatsapp there is facebook etc etc and where can you see proletariat at all that is the question be you don't have i don't see any proletariat i see all white collar workers etc etc there is no proletariat at all so what are you talking about vanguard this is not it is this is not bourgeoisie talking this is actual workers of parliamentary left talking to me about this now the relevance of these ideas 
course, there is no way of uh, taking them all together and putting it in the Indian context. That's not going to work. That's not going to work for any ideas. But it is very relevant to the Indian context because of three or four reasons. First, because of the development of the dynamics of capitalism. The dynamics of capitalism, the main development that I can see all around is all around proletarianism, proletarianization. The fact is not that proletariat is disappearing. The fact is that everyone is becoming a proletariat without being conscious of it. Now, now the bourgeois economy is so strong that you mistake it for the disappearance of the proletariat. But this guy who is talking to me is an IT industry guy. They are the worst proletariat in the history of proletariat struggles. Anyway, they are much worse than, uh, I have a lot of friends in, a uh, lot of unfortunate friends in IT sector. And I can see that they are, there are many, there are many comrades here also. I can see that they are much worse than the industrial proletariat of England in the 18th century, about which uh, Engels talked about. Now, and I am a, a teacher, I mean, I work in a university, I teach mechanical engineering to students. Now, I am a basic, full-blown proletariat. <clears throat> People may not, you know, post-Marxist, post-modernist may laugh at this, saying that you are a white-collar worker, you are a petty bourgeois, etc., etc. But if you see Marx very close, if you see, if you read uh, first volume of Capital, if you read Theories of Surplus Value, fourth or fifth chapter when he talks about Adam Smith and the definition of a productive and unproductive worker, if you read that chapter very carefully, he defines, Marx defines worker, productive worker, <clears throat> not based on what he produces. Adam Smith, Ricardo, the whole political economy uh, defines a worker as one who produces commodities, tangible commodities, which I can touch. So, a man who produces this is a proletariat, a man who produces an industrial proletariat, etc., etc. A teacher does not produce something. He does not produce anything, so he is obviously not a worker, not a proletariat. But then, Marx says, and he quotes, he says that a teacher can be a proletariat and is a proletariat if surplus value is being extracted from him. So, the idea is not one who produces tangible commodities, the idea is that a proletariat is one from whom surplus value is being extracted. This is said by uh, Marx at least thrice. In his capital twice, in his theories of surplus value, he develops it over 40 to 50 pages. But then post-Marxists, I don't think I've seen this at all. I, I, they have not seen anything about Marx, so it's not a big thing. But then it's very relevant to us today because what is happening is not deproletarianization. What is happening is complete proletarianization of erstwhile petty bourgeoisie. See, the teaching class was a basic petty bourgeoisie. They were under the state, state government, school, state government. Then it's petty bourgeoisie. No one is extracting surplus value from them. Right now, 80% of the universities are private universities and they are there for a profit. They make profit out of my, you know, out of my labor. So we are proletariat, IT school guys are proletariat, even doctors, even doctors are becoming workers, uh, cab drivers, it's a very important case, this Uber and Ola coming up, what, what are they doing? They are making this petty bourgeois uh, cab drivers who owned the cab and drove the cab, basic petty bourgeois uh, people, wherein they are extracting their own surplus value, nothing, no one else is extracting that. They are driving, uh, Uber and Ola is driving them to become drivers, which means they are being proletarianized. And wherever parliamentary left is strong, they are against Uber and Ola. Right now in Kerala, there is no Uber and Ola. Uh, in, even in Ernagulam, there is no Uber and Ola. So, uh, this we have already talked about, the left fetish about, you know, stopping the proletarianization, stopping handicrafts from going broke, etc., etc. But what is happening is clearly all round proletarianization. But this proletarianization has a big problem. The proletariat now, nowadays, do not know at all that he is a proletariat. This problem was not there in 18th or 19th century. An industrial proletariat at least knows that he is a worker. The problem with them, as far as Lenin was concerned, that he is stuck with economism. 
this worker can go up to economism he can clearly see that the uh, my interests are different from the interest of the employer but he cannot link this to the movement of capitalism towards socialism right now the problem is not economism but today's proletariat is not even able to rise up to economics because we don't see it workers struggling we don't there is huge layoffs from it companies all over india and no big struggle from the part of no spontaneous struggle from the part of uh, it workers are coming up which means that even spontaneously spontaneity is lacking even when they are protesting in bangalore <coughs> ah. they put uh, ah yes they, yes yes they are yes a friend you will be fired you will be fired that is there that is also there for teachers that is also there for all other petty bourgeois yes so it really means that there is no one to bring them all together and make these spontaneous protests which are in their minds even from coming out so this problem is much worse than the problem of 19th century or 20 in the beginning of 20th century now we need a vanguard party more than ever there is a scope for vanguard party more than ever because these petty bourgeois who are being brushed into the ranks of the proletariat don't even know that they are proletariat so even spontaneity is lacking another very very important problem is that see the basic instinct of a petty bourgeois who is being brushed into the ranks of the proletariat is to go back he wants to go back and become a proletariat some uh, sorry become a petty bourgeois somehow that is the basic class outlook of a petty bourgeois he cannot help it no one completely embraces being proletarianized he has to be taught that it is a good thing otherwise he always want even communist manifesto says that the instinctual response of petty bourgeoisie is to go back this go back instinct of petty bourgeoisie is a great thing for fascists fascists all over the world has made very good use of it see fascism has a tendency has an atavistic tendency to go back at, at least an illusionary go back and these petty bourgeois strata can be clearly uh, made use of i mean they can be influenced by this uh, this atavistic uh, lineage that fascism brings so it is petty bourgeoisie like proletarianized those petty bourgeoisie who are getting proletarianized are fodder for fascism all around the world and india also you see all the petty bourgeois the it sector you see uh, doctors you see you see erstwhile uh, uh, white collar workers who are getting proletarianized who are you know who are scared like hell that they lose their jobs etc etc they are very good fodder for fascists so if they don't get if this petty bourgeois strata who are getting proletarianized do not get uh, clearly Uh, directed towards revolutionary class consciousness fascism is going to win india india so it is vanguard party of the proletariat is in a sense much more needed in india right now in because we are staring at fascism than it was needed in russia even in 1902 so it is not true to say that lenin and vanguard uh, vanguard party is over uh, so the hegemony of the bourgeoisie is so complete and is being reinforced by barraging media every day who work overtime to keep the coordinates of debate firmly within the coordinates of bourgeois ideology that a vanguard party is much in need now this was very much in you can see this in this nationalism versus anti nationalism debate mainly run by arnab goswami see there was a big negative campaign about arnab goswami saying that he is calling all of us anti nationalists he is saying that they are nationalists etc etc but see the main complaint was that he was not letting us speak he was calling us names nationalists anti nationalists etc he was not letting us speak our minds etc but no one appreciated the fact that the problem was not that you were not able to answer the problem is with the question itself the question that the media are posing it is not that ideal leftists are not able to answer that or not given space to answer that the question itself is wrong the question itself is fairly within the ambit of bourgeois ideology 
and this question is what see so what does progressive left do progressive media forums left do they try to answer the question because corporate media does not let us answer the question so let me answer the question in this alternate media but that is not the point the point is that the question is wrong why is the question wrong the question is between nationalism and anti-nationalism and the left says that see clearly fascists are the anti-nationalists we are the real nationalists that is true fascists are anti-nationalists you just need to see their history in national in the struggle for independence you see that they had nothing to do with struggle for independence they had nothing to do with nationalism at all but now they are coming up as great nationalists and communists who have uh, split spilled blood all over the nationalist struggle are now being uh, called anti-nationalists this is not true they say and this has to be uh, uh, told to the public but the problem is with this nationalist anti-nationalist debate itself see rss was not with nationalists in 1945 because nationalism in 1945 was a progressive bourgeois phenomenon it was progressive at that time as lenin has told many times it is progressive in democratic revolution nationalism is a progressive force at one point of history when bourgeois is a progressive force but bourgeois class is a progressive force that is when capitalism is developing after that when capitalism decays when capitalism hits the crisis when it becomes moribund when it becomes the decayed thing nationalism also becomes not progressive it seeps into chauvinism basically so this this path of nationalism from 1945 to national chauvinism in 2015 is a natural process it is not something which is against history it is it is historical it is a natural process because capitalism uh, nationalism is a bourgeois ideology it is a capitalist ideology when capitalism decays it also decays now why is bjp and rss supporting it now because now it is not progressive it has completely exhausted all its progressive credentials and that is why bjp is supporting it now rss is supporting it now they could not have supported it now in 1945 because that then it was progressive but this thing is the real proletarian position as far as i understand from lenin's and marx's writings but then this if you need to highlight this you need to change the question not the answer and to change the question was not the idea which was followed even in jnu protest it was not followed there was an over enthusiasm to to prove that we are the real nationalists the problem is you have to problematize nationalism itself and this is why we need a proletarian vanguard we need a lenin or a proletarian vanguard to clearly say the workers the proletariat the semi toilers that the question that you are being posed is wrong so media fascism etc etc informalization informalization of workers parcelization of uh, the the production everything makes spontaneous generation of class consciousness workers is becoming impossible as evidenced by popular and spontaneous struggle petering out very easily all around the globe so this is the relevance so uh, uh, it's not dead and dusted it is very relevant now how much time do i have i have overshooted my time okay i'll take 20 minutes more okay so uh, this is the second uh, important contribution that uh, important intervention that lenin made third very crucial and important intervention was made in 1905 when democratic revolution was uh, being uh, carried out in russia now <clears throat> Democratic revolutions, revolution came very, excuse me. <clears throat> Democratic revolution came to Russia only in 1905 to 1906. <clears throat> um, so the classical Marxist theory of democratic revolution, bourgeois revolution, was that bourgeoisie is uh, uh, normally leads the bourgeois revolution french revolution it was led essentially by bourgeois intellectuals and bourgeoisie english revolution to a particular extent was led by, by the bourgeoisie uh, so mensheviks social revolution mensheviks were telling in russia in 1905 that this is 
Russia's bourgeois revolution. It is against autocracy. It is for the uh, development of capitalism in Russia. So bourgeoisie has to lead it. What is the role of the proletariat? We support the bourgeoisie. We watch, wait, support the bourgeoisie. Don't do anything else. Because if we do anything else on our own, if the proletariat does anything on our own, it will scare the bourgeoisie. So the bourgeoisie will recoil from even the bourgeois revolution. That was the Menshevik idea. So Mensheviks thought that bourgeois revolution is to be consummated by the bourgeoisie itself. Proletariat has a very passive role in this. <clears throat> but then <clears throat> Lenin made an extremely important intervention at this point of time, which is very, very creative and very original in the history of Marxism itself. Lenin told or Lenin came up with the position that bourgeoisie can no longer completely consummate the bourgeois revolution. They may have consummated the bourgeois revolution in France, but Marx had already seen the treachery of bourgeoisie in 1848 revolutions in Europe and 1871 Paris Commune in Europe. <clears throat> there itself, the bourgeoisie, you can see, recoiled at the crucial junctures. There was recoil at crucial junctures. So Lenin developed that idea and developed the position of the treachery of the bourgeoisie, the inability of the bourgeoisie, the consummate, the develop, democratic revolution and need for the proletariat themselves to lead the democratic revolution. So he uh, developed this idea in his book, Two Tactics in Democratic Revolution, 1905, in which he writes, and I quote Lenin, it does not follow that democratic revolution could not take place both in a form advantageous to make advantageous mainly to the big capitalists, financial magnates and enlightened landlord and in a form advantageous to the peasant and the worker. So what he is maintaining here as he maintains in two tactics is that there are bourgeois revolutions and bourgeois revolutions. You can have a bourgeois revolution, you can have, you can consummate a bourgeois revolution in a form which is very advantageous to capitalists, landlords, ruling class, etc. Or you can consummate a bourgeois revolution in a form which is very advantageous to the proletariat. What is the form of bourgeois revolution which is very advantageous to the proletariat? That is a question. <clears throat> but before that, we have to see the Indian case of democratic revolution. Freedom struggle is nothing but democratic revolution in India. And afterwards, what we had in the guise of welfare state, you know, mixed economy, etc., etc., what we had is capitalism itself. We had high dose of uh, uh, state funding because the capitalism in India was not strong for developing the, in, developing the infrastructure. So we had to have some kind of state intervention, otherwise it couldn't work. This democratic revolution that we had in India was consummated in a way which is totally in favor of the bourgeoisie and the landlord class. At every point, you can see uh, compromises. At every point, there was compromises with landlords, with feudal caste, etc., etc., class, etc., etc. You take the issue of religion. See, take the issue of religion, the way in which it was dealt with in French Revolution and in the freedom struggle. French Revolution dealt the most radical death to religion possible under bourgeois reforms, which is what is called, uh, <clears throat> uh, I don't remember the French name, uh, ah? yeah, but there is a French name to, ah? okay, it was consummated in the sense that religion is a personal effect. <clears throat> that was the French revolution idea of religion complete divorce between religion and state and complete it's not a public affair at all you make it a private affair if you have your belief it's fine that is it don't make it a pub public affair in india that was not done at all indian democratic revolution was consummated in a very religious sense with gandhi at its helm at its helm so if you see the indian national congress it really had two two camps one was the you know, the Atavistic camp, which looked at Indian uh, culture, etc., etc. Another one was a forward-looking camp, which was under Nehru. These two camps were brought together by Gandhi, and Gandhi, in his philosophy and in his life, 
is the living embodiment of that uh, compromise. So it was made in a very compromising manner. And so Lenin's idea on democratic revolution is very important in India because the Indian revolution was consummated in this manner. So what is the manner in which a democratic revolution can be consummated, which is very good for working class. Uh, uh, Lenin writes, the working class is therefore most certainly interested in the broadest, freest and most rapid development of capitalism. The removal of all remnants of old order which hamper the broad, free and rapid development of capitalism is of absolute advantage to the working class. The bourgeois revolution is precisely an upheaval that most resolutely sweeps away survivals of the past, survivals of the serf owning system and most fully generate, guarantees the broadest, freest and the most rapid development of capitalism. So Lenin says that democratic revolution has to be consummated in a radical fashion so that it can lead to the most freest and broadest development of capitalism. This will lead to direct fight between proletariat and the capitalism. If you preserve remnants of past, if you preserve remnants of feudalism into this, that can hamper this directness of the fight and that can happen the, class, the development of class consciousness of the proletariat after the democratic revolution. So he says, and I quote, it is to the advantage of the bourgeoisie to rely on certain remnants of the past as against the proletariat, for instance, on the monarchy, standing army, etc., etc. It is to the advantage of the bourgeoisie for the bourgeois revolution not to sweep away all remnants of the past too resolutely, but keep some of them. That is, for this revolution not to be fully consistent, not complete, not to be determined and relentless. Social democracy often expresses this idea somewhat differently by stating that bourgeois betrays its own self, that the bourgeois betrays the cost of uh, liberty, that the bourgeoisie is incapable of being consistently democratic. So the idea of Lenin was that bourgeoisie cannot consummate the democratic revolution in 1905. It has to be consummated in the most radical fashion by the proletariat. So Lenin theorized that proletariat is the leading class, not only in the proletariat, proletarian revolution, but in the democratic revolution as well. Proletariat has to lead the bourgeoisie, has to make sure that the bourgeois consummate all the revolutionary potentialities of the democratic revolution as well. This is a very uh, original thing to say because this is goes against classical Marxist uh, idea of democratic revolution and uh, it is very important in the Indian context, uh, in the Indian revolutionary context. So uh, not only this, Lenin's whole position on, on democracy is also important. So democracy and the proletariat, uh, the, see the bourgeois, especially now that it is in the moribund state of capitalism, has lost all interest for genuine democracy. It is rooting for fascism to take it through the crisis. Hence, the proletariat has to keep the dialectical balance between democratic demand, demands and revolutionary orientation. Indian bourgeoisie was not very keen on democratic reforms even in 1945, when capitalism was at its helm, at its biggest, at, at, its, at its best, 1945 to something like 1965, what is called the golden uh, era of capitalism. Now, we have a capitalism which is in global crisis. At this point of time, the bourgeois class is not in any way interested in democracy at all. So the, the fact that democracy is being butchered all over the world is not an exception. It is the rule. It will be butchered in the crisis time of capitalism and the bourgeois class, the democratic class, the liberal class not doing going to do anything about that because this will take them through the crisis that they will have. So it is now the revolutionary duty of the proletariat to advance democratic demands, even democratic demands, but in a consistent revolutionary manner, not in a bourgeois manner. How can that be done? Lenin says, the proletariat cannot be victorious except through democracy. That is, by giving full effect to democracy and by linking with each stage of its struggle, democratic demands formulated in the most resolute terms. We must combine the revolutionary struggle against capitalism 
with a revolutionary program and tactics for all democratic demands. A republic, a militia, a popular election of officials, equal rights for women, self-determination of nations. These were democratic demands at that time. Lenin continues, while capitalism exists, these demands, all of them, can only be accompanied, accomplished as an exemption, exception, and even then in an incomplete and distorted form. Basing themselves on the democracy already achieved and exposing its incompleteness under capitalism, we demand the overthrow of capitalism, the expropriation of the bourgeoisie as a necessary basis both for the abolition of poverty of the masses and for the complete and all-round institution of democratic reforms. So this is the dialectical balance that he keeps between revolutionary democratic demands, that is consistently revolutionary democratic demands and the demand for the ex expropriation of the bourgeoisie themselves. It has to go hand in hand. And he says, and I quote, the social revolution is not a single battle, but a period covering a series of battles over all sorts of problems of economic and democratic reforms, which are consummated only by the expropriation of the bourgeoisie. It is for the sake of final aim that we must formulate every one of our democratic demands in a consistently revolutionary manner. So here you see again the actuality of revolution shining through his writings. The fact that he is always analyzing concrete situations with the final aim in his mind. He is having the total uh, social process clearly in his mind when he does this. So uh, the, the connection between revolutionary politics and democratic demands, the connection between revolutionary politics and democratic revolution, the fact that proletariat and only proletariat will be able to consummate even the democratic demands is very important in India right now and it is very important in the time of uh, fascism. Time of fascism in the time of moribund capitalism where bourgeoisie, liberal uh, democrats, liberal intelligentsia has lost all real interest in the preservation of democratic demands. <clears throat> so the fourth and most important intervention, another intervention which he made is on the fact of imperialism. Now uh, I won't go deep into it because I have already overstepped <coughs> my position. I will take five minutes and close this. There is a wrong idea going around that Lenin's idea of imperialism was based on the necessity of inter-imperialist rivalry and inter-imperialist wars. There is an idea which is being advanced right now that inter-imperialist rivalries has died down, which is correct. They have died down and there are no inter-imperialist wars now because there are no wars, there, there, there is no third world war. It, that, that potentiality is correctly there, but then it, it is not happening. There are other types of wars, but then there are no inter-imperialist rivalries. The, the in, imperialist powers are making it very clear or are uh, 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 know that inter-imperialist rivalries should not be taken after a particular, it, it should not be given uh, war time at least. So then it is advanced that uh, as imperialist wars have died down, the prospect of world revolution has already died down. And as the prospect of world revolution has died down, we should go back to social democratic politics, to welfareist politics, because revolution is not going to happen anyway. This is wrong because Lenin's idea of imperialism was based on three aspects, out of which one obviously was the possibility of inter-imperialist rivalries. When there are inter-imperialist rivalries, it gives an opportunity of world revolution. But there are two other important things which Lenin said about imperialism, which are very important. The first thing, the primary aspect of Lenin's critique of imperialism, according to Lenin, and I quote Lenin, if it were necessary to give the briefest possible definition of imperialism, we should have to say that imperialism is the monopoly stage of capitalism. That is, a stage in which capitalism has outgrown all its progressive potential and is in its state of decay. That is the definition that Lenin gave for imperialism. It is the state of decay of capitalism. And you can see right now that imperialism, we are living in imperialist age and we are in the state of decay of capitalism. We are in moribund stage of capitalism. 
So then he says further that monopolies, oligarchy, the striving for domination and for freedom, exploitation of an increased number of small or weak nations by a handful of richest or more powerful nations, all of these have given birth to these distinctive characteristics of imperialism which compel us to define it as parasitic or decayed capitalism. That is what Lenin says about imperialism. And this is why when he realized that world has become imperialist, he advocated world revolution and Russian revolution, proletarian revolution. Because the imperialism, advent imperialism means that capitalism does not have anything progressive to give to the world right now. So it is time for proletarian revolution. But then proletarian revolution is nothing we can nothing that we can conjure up as we will. It is not it is not possible to conjure up revolutions. There has to be objective conditions. The objective conditions for revolutions has to uh, materialize, has to ripen. The second main point that Lenin raised about imperialism is that uh, the second crucial insight on Lenin, uh, crucial insight on imperialism, as far as Lenin was concerned, is its place, imperialism plays in history. He says in his pamphlet, Imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, <clears throat> that we have seen that its economic essence, imperialism, is monopoly, monopoly capitalism. This in itself determines its place in history, the place of imperialism in history. For monopoly that grows out of the soil of free competition and precisely out of free competition is the transition from capitalist system to a higher social economic system. So he says that imperialism gives us the objective conditions for transfer onto socialism. So he says that it is decay of capitalism. There is nothing progressive that capitalism can give us. Second, that this decay of capitalism is already making sure that the objective conditions needed for the transfer to socialism has already been created. He is telling this in 1914. We are now 100 years after 1914. There are still people who think that objective conditions for capitalism has not been or, or socialism has not been met. So. Uh, these are the two important aspects of Lenin's theory of imperialism. And the third aspect, obviously, is that there is a chance of proletarian revolution because wars between imperialist countries uh, break out. And the idea of Lenin was to convert these inter-imperialist wars to civil wars. When he actually put up this idea, many in Russia, many among the Bolsheviks actually thought that Lenin had got mad. Krupskaya, in her memoirs, clearly states that when, see, all over Russia, there was, all over the world, there was different ideas on war and consistent uh, uh, anti-war propaganda were being carried out by many revolutionary groups. But to, but to clearly state that the idea, the, the need was to transfer or to change revolution, uh, inter-imperialist war to civil war, that is, bo to, to, uh, defeat your own bourgeoisie, to work against your own nation is something which is, which even Bolsheviks could not, uh, you know, understand at that time. Krupskaya says that many Bolsheviks thought that Lenin had completely gone mad. But then it is, it is the correct idea. We know that it is the correct idea right now based on these ideas of imperialism. I don't have time to develop, unfortunately, develop these ideas, but then uh, it is available all over the place. Uh, so, it is the objective conditions which are prepared by imperialism that told Lenin or forced Lenin to say that you have to consummate proletarian revolution, you have to make, uh, change the imperialist war into a civil war to make proletarian revolution. The last idea, which I will finish in two minutes, <coughs> is the idea again of a revolutionary party of a vanguard party. Many people say, there is a huge debate going around, that uh, it is too restrictive an idea. Lenin was not at all for democracy inside the party. He was he was a dicta dictator inside the party, etc, etc. But then it is not true. If you go through Lenin's complete works, you can see that it is not true. I will just quote one instance wherein he says, the article that he wrote in uh, 
uh, around 1906 is entitled freedom to criticize and unity of action and in which he says criticism of the party he is saying criticism within the limits of the principles of the party program must be quite free not only at party meetings but also at public meetings such criticisms or such agitation for criticism is insepar inseparable from agitation cannot be prohibited this uh, this was when uh, the russian social democratic party tried to ban agitation beyond a particular limit so he says in uh, in volna that such a such a thing cannot be banned obviously uh, central committee has defined freedom to criticize inaccurately and too narrowly and unity of action inaccurately and too broadly let us take an example this is very interesting the congress decided that the party should take part in duma elections taking part in elections is a very definitive action during the elections no member of the party anywhere has any right whatever to call upon the people to abstain from voting nor can criticism of the decision to take part in elections be tolerated during this period for it would in fact jeopardize success in the election campaign before the elections have been announced however party members everywhere have a right to have a perfect right to criticize the decision to take part in the elections of course the application of this particle in practice this principle in practice will sometime give rise to disputes and misunderstandings but only on the basis of this principle can all disputes and all misunderstandings be settled honorably for the party the resolution of central committee however creates an impossible situation the central committee's resolution is essentially wrong and runs counter to the party rules the principle of democratic centralism and autonomy for local party organizations implies universal and full freedom to criticize as long as this does not di disturb the unity of a definite action it rules out all criticism which disrupts or makes difficult the unity of an action decided on by the party this is not the way in which almost 99% of so called marxist leninist groups right now work i can vouch for kerala politics in which you can get dismissed from uh, you know social democratic reformist parliamentary marxist leninist parties for even telling a word against the official party decision in facebook for example a main poet wrote a poem criticizing the party decision party lethargy in fact and he got fired and lenin was evoked to fire him you have to compare this with mayakovsky mayakovsky wrote a very important poem very imp uh, impressive poem in 1918 criticizing the russian party uh, i don't remember the full poem but it runs as follows uh, uh, a comrade asks what what about the decision and the party says let me have the meeting that is how it goes meeting 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 and it was a direct attack on the party in 1918 when civil war was going on if you need to fire this guy you have, you have to fire them because this is 1918 when all types of attacks was given on the party but lenin in a public meeting said that i don't read poetry often uh, i don't read mayakovsky's poetry at all and i am not going to judge mayakovsky's poems because i am not a good judge of poems but this poem should be read by every comrade in russia this is a poem which castigates the party but this is correct we are having too much of meetings and this has to be read to every comrade this is lenin's idea but then we i mean now marxist leninist uh, especially parliamentary groups have a very vulgarized idea of lenin so here you see that lenin envisioned criticism in the most broadest terms it should not disturb practice that is all you can criticize anything anywhere we want without disturbing unity of action that is what he defined designed as uh, defined as democratic centralism so i would close by saying that far from uh, what patnaik contends that <clears throat> far from lenin being a relic being over lenin He is the most important thinker that we have right now. He is a shining light that we have to analyze, we have to study, put in context, and uh, sort of see from his 
experience what can be done in our context. I would close by uh, quoting Mayakovsky from Mayakovsky's poem, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, which was written after Lenin died. This came out in 1925. And I quote uh, Mayakovsky, People are boats, although on land. While life is being roughed, all species of trash from the rocks and the sand stick to the sides of our craft. But then, having broken through the storm's mad froth, one sits in the sun for a time and cleans off the tousled seaweed growth and oozy jellyfish slime. I go to Lenin to clean off mine and to sail on with the revolution. I think it is time for us also to clean off our slimes and to go to Lenin and to sail on with the revolution. Thank you for listening.